Welcome back to the Tom Hartman program. I'm Alex Austin filling in for Tom, who is working on a documentary on climate change. This is my last hour here with you. I promise Tom is back on Monday. You're only stuck with me for one more hour. But give us a call, because I want to hear from you, as many of you as possible. And uh, to help me uh, with all of the calls and joining me in studio is my great friend, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, also known as Dr. America, uh, host of Dr. America on We Act Radio. Sanjeev, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me again. And um, let's take some calls. Let's do it. We're going to go to Leonard in California. Leonard, you're on the line. Hi there, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I'd like to speak on racism. It was really created by the greedy. You know, how does the sun make somebody better than somebody else? It's all a, it's all a scheme to make money. Um, it's all, all racism does is glorify the white race. So therefore, the racists are kind of silly, aren't they? They're part of the 99%, and they're helping the one-tenth of 1% so that we stay divided and we never get together and show our true power and really run the country like we want to if we ever got together. They don't like that. All they're doing is supporting the one-tenth of one percent, and they're part of that, that, that group of guys. They're dangerous to themselves and others, you know, that's for sure. So therefore, they're, uh, you know, they're really a danger to us, or our, our true enemy. The true enemy of the working class is the greed of the uh, uh, oligarchs. Uh, um, they're doing everything that's everything is based on feelings. They want to get to people's feelings. That's why racism kind of exists a little bit because they're trying to talk to people's feelings rather than their brain. We really got to start thinking a lot more clearly. You know, supporting the, 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 the one tenth of one percent is like supporting your neighborhood but bully. You know, hey, you just took my, my lunch money. Ooh. If this is not working for for any of us, I really think Donald Trump is only speaking to the one tenth of one percent. He's making it great for them but not for us, making life real miserable for the rest of us. Leonard, thanks so much for your call. Sanjeev? You know, um, I th it, when I was listening to him, one of the, it reminded me actually of a story that I've, I've heard about Martin Luther King when he was in jail and how he would befriend the jailers. And, uh, and when the jailers got to know him more and more, they, uh, they actually found common cause with a lot of what Dr. King was marching for and it was because of that human connection of describing that, look, we're not this entire march, this entire movement is not just about uh, ending racism in this country or fighting racism in this country. It's about fighting poverty in this country. And one of the things that he was able to really connect on is that, look, you and like, you know, you and us on either side of these bars have a lot more in common than the people that we're fighting against out there. And, you know, I hope that when, you know, when I'm out and you're out, that we can, you know, work together. And it was and it was very it's a very interesting situation because you would hardly ever expect that, you know, I mean, the two groups would ever find common ground. But they did. And I think that there I mean, there is some truth to I mean, you know, what the caller is talking about, where, you know, racism is a very effective you know, divide when you're trying to distract people from uh, economic interests and other kinds of policy goals that would end up serving everyone, uh, regardless of their race, and um, and I do think that th that our opposition knows how to you know I mean I would say that they're just blowing a dog whistle but they've gone way beyond that they want everyone to hear it it's a bullhorn and uh, and I think that you know they are they are really playing people um, to vulnerabilities that are not are not really American, are not really uh, what people are truly worried about. And it is a, uh, you know, it's, a, uh, it's not new. Uh, white supremacy is definitely a tool of control mm -hmm. uh, by the bosses, by the billionaire class, uh, and it is based on the very old strategy of dividing and conquering. Uh, FDR talked about it, and he referenced... Uh, that you go all the way back in ancient history, mm -hmm. and uh, you can read in Herodotus, the oldest trick of the tyrant is to divide those he's oppressing and aim them at each, each other. other. Right. So by dividing people up and saying, well, you're this type and you're that type and you're this type, 
Uh, and it can be done by race with white supremacy. There, uh, they can try to divide people up by age uh, and say, you know, oh, well, the old people are taking all the, so, or the young people are right. all lazy. Or And again, it's all to right. divide people up so that together, multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, through the power of solidarity, we're not going to be able to, they divide us up so they we can't stand next to each other point at Wall Street and be like, no, it's all They're, them. Right. It's this very right. small group of right. people who have everything right. uh, and all of us standing together. Yeah. And that, that's why they do it because they're terrified of us. Yeah. I mean, and we see this even in healthcare. I think it's one of the reasons why Medicaid becomes such uh, such an easy target for you know the, the politicians point. of divide and conquer is that they constantly want to try and tell the taxpayer Oh, these undeserving Americans are getting health care off of your tax money. And meantime, nobody is really pointing to the insurance company and, and telling them, you know, you've been taking this worker's premiums month after month, year after year. And what exactly is this worker getting for it? You know, I mean, like when when premiums go up by 20, 25 percent. There are very few people who can actually go to a clinic or hospital, find something and say like, oh. That right there, that that's where my twenty to twenty five percent went. They they're going to see the same doctors. Maybe they're having this, you know, a good experience with that doctor, but it's taking a bigger and bigger chunk out of their paycheck. And yet, you know, you never hear the politician blame the insurance company for taking a bigger bite out of that out of a hard earned paycheck. But they love to point to the quote unquote undeserving American for. Be, committing the crime of being on Medicaid and seeking the basic human right of health care. And I think it's, again, it's speaking to that divide and conquer yep. thing when you realize that there are some real culprits here, but it's not the ones that we seem to keep blaming and attacking. Right, and uh, it is the uh, culprits are usually the ones pointing the finger. Mm -hmm. uh, the undeserving Americans are uh, the Wall Street executives, right. the insurance executives, who add literally nothing, nothing. Uh, and we've had a, a bunch of great conversations uh, this week about the transformation we want to see in, in the healthcare mm -hmm. uh, system away from an industry to a caregiving model right. focused on wellness and not right. profits. But I do, we had a caller earlier in the show who mm -hmm. you would have really enjoyed. He called <laughs> in to tell people about Medicaid and how important Medicaid is and how people, too many people have it wrong, yeah. uh, and it provides long-term care, yeah. uh, and anybody might need long-term care at any time if they face right. a life-changing right. accident. Uh, and I was like, yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the the what the House just passed, you know, uh, last week, is what is the exact thing that you do if you want to fail spectacularly at the opioid crisis, if you want to fail spectacularly at Zika, if you want to fail seniors and people in a long-term care facility, then that that is exactly the legislation that if you want a failing grade, that's the legislation you pass. And, uh, you know, the House signed their their names on it. We're going to hold them accountable. That's right. Let's take some more. Uh, let's take some more calls. Let's go to Joyce. Uh, Joyce in Montana. You're on the line. Joyce, are you there? Joyce, can you hear me? I'm sorry, Joyce, I can't hear you, so we're going to go to Barbara in Georgia. Barbara, are you there? Yeah, speakerphone, Alex. There you are. Hey, yes, thanks for I calling. And the reason I was calling in, because I, the real meaning of insurance, it seems like nobody really speaks of it, but my understanding, and you can set me right if I'm wrong, is to have the largest pool possible of people so whatever the expense is for the other people they're covered uh that's yeah, yeah that is uh barbara you're right that is the way uh insurance models work whether that is social insurance whether that's private insurance the idea being that when we're all in and we're all doing our little part um we all benefit and i mean insurance is supposed to be as simple as that, I, I prefer to, I mean, look at social insurance and that social contract that we have with each other, which speaks more to the values of the, the web of mutuality and how we're all kind of tied in together because at some point we were all young. At some point, you know, I mean, we're going to be old. 
We don't know who among us will, you know, I mean, face a disability. And uh, and because each of us has those vulnerabilities in life, both predictable and unpredictable, we should be looking out for each other. And insurance is one model for doing it. And social insurance is exactly so spreading the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so social security uh, is wage insurance. Right. And the idea is there are predictable loss of wages due to old age, right. and then unpredictable loss of wages if a person uh, becomes disabled or uh, the breadwinner uh, dies for yeah. the surviving dependents. And that by all of us together working on this in a social insurance model, uh, we can actually provide something that's impossible right. for us to provide on our own or in a private uh, in a pri right. on the private market. And it's the exact same, uh, it, that concept of what we can do working together, yeah. sharing the risk. If you move to a healthcare system where you just excise completely and totally the undeserving Americans yeah. who are the insurance industry, yeah. uh, and you base a, a system based on wellness, not on profits, right. what we would be doing is sharing the human risk, risk. Right. That is our lives. Right. None of us know right. who will get sick, who will not get yeah. sick. But we together, if we're all together, and we are all in it right. together, we can actually face that down in a much more efficient and humane yeah. uh, and rational model. And I mean, and we can be healthier for it. I mean, yeah. that's, the, that's the thing of it, is that, I mean, we can be much healthier for it under that model than we are now. I mean, the idea that, you know, the thing about getting sick in America is that, I mean, most patients, when they hear that they have something like cancer, you know, they hear a serious diagnosis like that. Yes, there is absolutely the concern about, are you going to get better? But are you going to get broke is usually the first questions on most Americans' mind. And that's just, that's un-American in my opinion. It's just wrong. Sanjeev Sriram, a.k.a. Dr. America. We're taking more of your calls on the Tom Hartman program right after this.